Okay, well, why don't we get started? First of all, welcome and thank you to come into this uh, webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Brian Gifford. Um, I'm the Senior Research Associate at the Integrated Benefits Institute. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some research findings from our latest uh, research product. Um, and we also have with us this morning Maria Henderson who is the Senior Director of Workforce Health for Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, I'm going to, right now, I, I think I have everybody's uh, microphones muted. Um, once, I, uh, once I give my presentation and Maria gives hers, I'm going to unmute everybody's uh, lines and then you can ask questions. We'll have a Q&A session uh, for a little bit. Um, excuse me. First of all, before we get started, let me say a little bit about the Integrative Benefits Institute, if you don't know. Um, we are a nonprofit member organization based in San Francisco, um, a 501c6. Um, we mainly look at how workers' health impacts their attendance and job performance. And we try to communicate to employers how they could benefit from viewing health care and wellness expenditures as investments in human capital rather than just the way they are typically looked at as uh, recruitment and retention expenses. Now, since IBI deals, you know, we, we look at things from the employer's perspective. Um, in that vein, workforce health we can think of as having an impact on an organization's performance in at least three ways. Um, one would be health care costs. The other would be lost work time. And finally, there's this issue of underperformance. Now, of course, health care costs are pretty straightforward. Most employers feel that they know them pretty well, at least in their own organization, even if they're, if they're self-insured or if they have a policy. Um, now, the impact of lost work time isn't nearly as clear, and part of the difficulty comes from the management of absence in different silos. So, for example, in an organization, you can have sick days, you can have uh, paid time off, salary continuation, sick banks, um, there's FMLA, obviously, short-term disability, workers' comp, long-term long disability, and probably a lot of other silos that, that you know, I haven't even thought of. Um, so there's this siloed effect that, that gives managers or, or gives employers some problems in dealing with absence. And even when they're not siloed or even when they're dealing with an individual type of absence, employers don't necessarily track these uh, all too well either. And, of course, the impact of underperformance on the job due to illness, the presenteeism issue, is even less visible and harder to measure than absence. And even though that's you know, part of IBI stock and trade, we're not even going to deal with that today. Um, today, instead, we're going to focus on two of the more tangible aspects of lost productivity, disability absence and leaves taken under the Family Medical Leave Act. And we'll break down some of those silos by taking a more integrated view of absence that addresses the fundamental question. Um, can FMLA, um, can it be used as an early warning system, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to prevent or ameliorate more costly disabilities? So again, I'm going to present some findings from IBI's latest research, and I'm going to discuss some of the expert advice we received uh, on how to get out in front of problems. And then we're going to hear from Maria Henderson um, about how PG&E approached FMLA absence in its workforce um, and did so with successful results. Okay. Now, anyone who's spoken with employers about FMLA or who's read the Department of Labor's most recent survey of employers understands that a lot of workplaces continue to have difficulties with different aspects of the policies. Okay? So there's difficulties with the process of certifying and tracking employees' time off under FMLA. Um, there's difficulties with uh, managing the disruptions of absences. When somebody's out, especially if they work with a team, it's going to be disruptive to the workflow. This is a problem for employers, particularly when we're dealing with unscheduled intermittent FMLA absence. And it's probably not too much of an exaggeration to say that after 20 years of the law, uh, many employers are experiencing what we might call FMLA fatigue. Right? Now, these challenges that FMLA poses, notwithstanding, um, the findings I'm going to present today um, shine some light on a different aspect of FMLA as an early warning for bigger problems. Because after all, um, when somebody requests time off for FMLA, when they say there's a serious medical condition of their own, or of a family member's, this is one of the few times um, when an employee is formally making a problem known to an employer before a disability emerges. 
And this is the time to collect to connect those employees with available health promotion and disease management resources in order to prevent future disabilities. And so as this schematic kind of shows you, um, if we're moving from left to right, there are multiple opportunities for employers to engage employees in ways that mitigate the damage when they have a serious medical condition. And every missed opportunity um, contributes to higher expenses down the road. So when somebody's saying they need time off, this is the time to get them into some kind of care that most or a lot of employers already offer, the short-term short disability claim. When somebody goes out on short-term disability claim, you want to try and help them return to work um, and certainly not extend their absence and certainly to try and uh, prevent it from becoming a long-term disability claim. Now, I get up, when I give talks, um, I, I like to eat dessert first. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of the study, uh, let me tell you what some of the key findings are. Um, on the one hand, when somebody asks for FMLA or when they go out on FMLA, um, whether or not they go out for their own condition or a family member's condition, uh, our results do show that it's a good predictor of whether or not somebody is going to have short-term disability relative to, uh, you know, to other people who don't go out on FMLA. Um, it's a predictor of both the likelihood of a claim <clears throat> and the duration of a claim if they should happen to go on uh, long-term disability. And again, when we find that employees who aren't eligible for FMLA for, for whatever reasons, um, we find that they may still benefit from interventions because just the fact that somebody is asking for FMLA leave, um, that indicates a higher likelihood of a, uh, of a short-term disability claim in the future. Okay. Now, we do see some kind of trade-off occurring. so. When employees work at organizations that don't offer short-term disability benefits, uh, we find that those employers tend to have more FMLA leave days than employers who do offer short-term disability benefits. So there's some trading off going on. We also find that short-term disability durations are longer when somebody has been using FMLA continuously. So they're using their FMLA entitlement before they go on short-term disability. We, we find that they're, uh, they're, le they're uh, or FTD claims tend to be a little bit longer than people who aren't using FMLA. And since FMLA is a predictor of longer short-term disability leaves, it's also a predictor of later long-term disability claims. Okay. Now, just a quick refresher on the type of leave programs I'm going to be covering today. FMLA, of course, <clears throat> is federal unpaid job-protected time off when an employee has a serious medical condition or when a family member has a serious medical condition. There are some criteria that make people eligible or ineligible for taking leave under FMLA. On the one hand, they have to be at a covered work site, and they have to have worked at an employer for a year uh, at least half time. And uh, FMLA leave can be used intermittently. That is, you know, somebody needs to take a day off or half a day off to, deal, to make an appointment, you know, to go to therapies, things like that. Or they get sick and it's, it's uh, under a covered uh, condition. They need to take that day off. They can do that as well, or they can use all their leave all at once. And a lot of employers, employers are, <clears throat> um, employers are allowed to uh, run FMLA concurrently with other kinds of leaves, such as workers' comp, short-term disability, sick days, and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, about 60% of U.S. employees are covered under FMLA. And at covered establishments, it's about 80% of employees. So there is a lot of exposure in the workforce um, for FMLA. Short-term disability, long-term disability, um, these are paid leave, of course, but the terms of, of the time off that people can take are set by the plan design, not by any kind of law. So we'll find that some, some short-term disability plans, for example, are going to have a waiting period of one or two days a week. Um, um, they have a set wage replacement rate and they have maximum benefit durations, usually about six months. Sometimes you'll see shorter, 13, 13 weeks, sometimes up to a year. Now, for this study, uh, we obtained data from, uh, from one of the leading uh, disability management organizations. So we got claims information and employee information for about a half a million employees across 160 employers. A few more for some of the different analyses, but generally in this area. And this is a time series data, so we're able to track the same people in an organization for up to five years, covering from 2007 to 2011. 
And we started this research with a few key questions that we wanted to answer. First of all, do people who use FMLA, are, are they more or less likely to have a short-term disability or a long-term disability than people who don't use FMLA? Because, you know, you, you can think of this as going either way. One is this, this is an indicator of need, FMLA requests. But on the other hand, if people are actually you know, getting some kind of therapeutic value out of taking their time off, this may be a way of, of uh, preventing or at least mitigating the likelihood of a later claim. And when somebody goes into the short-term disability system, do we find that their earlier use of FMLA is a predictor of how long their disability is going to be? Um, since we are talking about early warnings, um, we're looking a little bit more expansively and when somebody has a short-term disability claim, is there any information in that claim that is going to be predictive of a later short-term or a later long-term disability use so that benefits managers can start prioritizing care for getting people into you know, EAP programs, getting people into uh, disease management programs, and so on. And again, since we're talking about the Family Medical Leave Act, we, we really just have to address the elephant in the room of misuse of the program. We hear a lot uh, at IBI from employers about misuse, and one of, the term, one, of the, uh, one of the patterns we hear about is that people taking Fridays and Mondays off when, they have, when they're covered for a, a serious medical condition. So we wanted to just jump right into it and say, can we see any kind of pattern of, of leave acts that would lead us to, con to conclude that there is a certain amount of, of misuse in the system? Now, just to provide an overview of the data we worked with, um, over five years of observation, we found that one in four employees uh, had an FMLA leave, and one in seven had a short-term disability. So annually, that's about 5% and 3%. Understand that um, the, the basis or <clears throat> the denominator for this leave are everybody who works at the company. So if this seems a little bit low compared to what you might see in your own experience, that would be the reason, that would be one reason why. Uh, most FMLA leave takers are taking their leave continuously. Um, now, this is a good news, bad news story. On the one hand, when we hear from employers the difficulties of dealing with FMLA, we tend to hear about intermittent leave. Um, so when we see only 7% of people taking intermittent leave, that's the good news part of the story. But it is still one in three leave users um, who, are, who are using intermittent leave. Okay, so when, when we're dealing just with FMLA, we can say that a third of the people are actually falling into this category. Um, we tended to see, or, or we saw one denied leave request for every FMLA leave that was taken. But of course, a denied leave in this context would tend to be people who were not eligible or didn't do the paperwork that their employer requires properly. We only saw about one in four people with a denied leave who never used FMLA leave. So. You know, on the one hand, you know, this is a statutory program. It, it's once once somebody's eligible um, by rule to take leave, it's not up to the the employer's discretion for the most part to deny. And, and but and and this is basically what we see. Uh, very few pe people use long-term disability, um, but remember they had to go through the short-term disability system first. Generally, that this is one of the requirements of a long-term disability uh, plan. Now, most people who use a leave program at all are only going to use it in one out of the five years. Okay, and these are new leaves, so a leave that carries over across calendar years only counts as one leave. And there are two important things about this finding. One is it shows that the five-year results that I just went mostly driven by, mostly driven by different people. Okay, so it's not just the same 14% of employees that are using leave year after year. Um, but second, um, just because a serious condition requires time off from work, it doesn't mean that it's too late to connect people with available benefits, right? There are some people who are using, uh, for example, short-term leave in multiple years, okay? And this means there are people who could benefit from efforts to mitigate future leaves. So we're, you know, we're, we're starting to see a story emerge about engagement of employees. Once you know they have a problem, once you get them into either FMLA leave system or disability system, um, engagement should be sustained, right, if only to prevent uh, future leaves, even of the same kind, even if they're not long-term disability. Now, just in terms of providing a full picture of how FMLA and fit together from the employer's perspective, um, the data do provide some evidence that employees who don't have access to short-term disability benefits are using FMLA as a substitute. 
Okay, so there is still a productivity impact even if employer is not having to pay the, the wage replacement benefits. So here we see that workers whose, workers, uh, whose employer didn't offer short-term disability benefits average about 11 FMLA days over five years compared to about eight days otherwise. So obviously, there are a lot of people in both types of organizations that didn't use FMLA at all. But bear in mind that um, when we're talking about uh, employers that do have short-term disability benefits, this includes all of the FMLA leave that was taken concurrently with short-term disability. So we're really seeing a, a, lot, of, a lot more FMLA use going on in, in some of the companies that we saw that, that didn't offer short-term disability at all. Now, I mentioned before some of the challenges that employers face in dealing with intermittent leave. And one of the most frequent issues that IBI has heard from employers and from TPAs and from consultants um, is that some employees are using intermittent leave as a way to give themselves a long weekend. So a person gets a certification for a serious medical condition. That certification says this person can take leave on an on, or the, the, you know, their, their provider is, is advising that a person may need to take leave on an as-needed basis, and there's a suspicion that as-needed tends to occur more often on Fridays and Mondays than on other days. And this gives rise to a derisive nickname that some of you may have heard of FMLA as the Family Monday Leave Act. Now, because we had data on over 900,000 intermittent FMLA episodes from numerous employers um, over multiple years, we had an opportunity to assess the prevalence of this problem. And so we looked at these data in several different ways. We looked across industries. We looked across groups of employers who were, uh, you know, who used a lot of intermittent leave compared to those who didn't use very much intermittent leave. Uh, we looked at hour, hourly and salaried workers. We looked by age and gender. And the answers were consistent. Um, we didn't find any compelling evidence to suggest that intermittent leaves are more likely to be on a Monday or a Friday than on any other, any other weekday. And we did, well, obviously Saturdays and Sundays, um, since fewer people work, we did find that that tended to be the exception. But Friday to Tuesday, Friday to Thursday, we didn't see much of a difference. And we didn't find any evidence that leaves that were taken on a Friday or Monday tended to be any longer than on any other weekday, or that they, they were no more likelihood to be, to be for a full day off, which is exactly what we would expect if people were actually uh, using it to extend their weekend. Now, this doesn't mean that some employees don't misuse their certifications this way. I, I'm certain that they do. Um, it doesn't say anything about whether unscheduled FMLA tends to occur on Monday or Friday. We, don't have, we, didn't, don't have, we didn't have any information to, to determine whether or not a, a particular episode was somebody who just called in that morning or somebody who had, who had scheduled this ahead of time. <clears throat> uh, we don't know whether employees use uh, you know, intermittent leave to circumvent absence and tardiness policy. So they know they're going to be late. They say, I'm not going to be able to make it today. Um, I, I'm sure that all of this does happen in some organizations. Um, what it does suggest is that to the extent that this kind or, or these kinds of misuse are occurring, and regardless of the headaches that they cause, and, and we recognize that they do cause a lot of problems for employers, um, this isn't the dominant pattern of FMLA leave taking. The vast majority of intermittent leave users, it, it, it would appear to be that they're employees who might benefit from health and wellness programs that employers already offer because they tend to be using it in a, in a predictable uh, you know, on an as-needed fashion okay, without a lot of evidence of misuse. Okay? Now, here we come to what I think of as the heart of this analysis, which answers the question of whether a request for FMLA leave indicates a higher-than-average likelihood of a later, later short-term disability claim. Okay? And the average is clearly yes. And so if we take a person with, who had no FMLA leave activity in one year, they're our baseline case. They had about a 3% chance of a short-term disability for a physical health condition in the next year. And by physical health, I mean, you know, I, I'm excluding pregnancies. I'm excluding uh, mental health conditions. I'll talk a little bit more about those. But these are illnesses that people have, chronic illnesses, accidents, injuries, and so on. Okay. So the baseline is about 3%. Um, now, if a person had any type of FMLA leave, 
their chance of a short-term disability use um, in the next year is anywhere from 40 to 100% greater than the baseline. And all of these results um, are adjusted for um, the employee's age, uh, their sex, organizational characteristics such as industry, uh, whether or not they used FMLA you know, during this, this, uh, this baseline year and so on. Okay. And again, people can use different kinds of, of FMLA use, but we're modeling these all at the same time, so you can look at these as uh, having independent effects from one another. Okay, so you can think of these as populations of people who own one kind of leave. Now, the type of leave that a person uh, goes on seems to matter as well. And so a leave for a, an employee's own medical condition, um, in terms of, of being a predictor of a physical health uh, short-term disability claim, it matters more than if they took leave for a family member's condition. But, you know, this is important. Family conditions still matter for physical health disability claims. So when somebody is, is taking time off to help a family member deal with a, a serious health condition, we're still going to see a higher likelihood of a short-term disability claim later on for a physical condition. Um, and again, I've, I've mentioned this earlier, people who are denied FMLA leave also have a higher than average likelihood of a later uh, short-term disability claim. Okay. And so this bears repeating, just because an employee doesn't qualify for unpaid time off under FMLA, it doesn't mean that they're not going to have some kind of serious medical condition, and it doesn't mean that they won't end up taking paid time off later on. Okay. So this is an intervention point for employers once somebody is asking for time off a leave. Even if they're not eligible, they still may be eligible for benefits that can help mitigate a leave or, or mitigate a short-term disability claim. Now, the results are similar when we consider short-term disability claims for mental health conditions as well. Uh, we see the same kind of pattern generally when somebody is, is uh, using FMLA in one year. Uh, they're more likely to have a short-term disability claim for a mental health condition in the next year. Um, I will point out, however, that relative to the baseline group, um, when somebody has a, an FMLA leave for a family condition, um, this appears to be more important for mental health claims than it is for physical health claims. So relative to the baseline in this case, uh, we're seeing that the chance of a mental health short-term disability claim in the next year for le family leave takers uh, is doubled, as opposed to only 50% greater for physical health short-term disability. And this is exactly what we would expect if the stress of caring for an ill family member is contributing to a member's need for disability leave. Intuitively, it just makes sense um, that a stress-related problem would take the form of anxiety or depression than it would for some kind of somatic condition. And note as well that the patterns are similar for continuous and intermittent leaves in both of these cases. So just because somebody is trying to deal with a condition on an, on, on an as-needed basis, taking their, their leave here and there, dealing with problems as they come up, rather than taking all their time continuously, that doesn't mean that their condition is less serious. We tend to see that, that they are, in fact, uh, more likely than the baseline group to have a short-term disability claim. Now, it's unrealistic to expect that even the most effective health promotion or disease management program is going to prevent every short-term disability claim, uh, in which case the priority becomes reducing the duration of a disability leave when it does, in fact, occur. Okay. And our results provide some insight into what can be learned about uh, short-term disability durations based on earlier FMLA experiences. And so compared to short-term disability claimants who didn't have any prior FMLA use before they went on STD, and this is only about 10% of the sample, um, we find that people who are using their leave concurrently with short-term disability, um, or people who are using FMLA and, and short-term disability concurrently, I should say, um, they have leaves that are about six days longer than the baseline group. Okay, so they have six more disability absences paid for under short-term disability. Now, employees who had used their FMLA entitlement uh, before their short-term disability claim, maybe they didn't use it all, but they started taking FMLA and then they stopped and then they went on short-term disability at some time later, um, they had leaves that are about nine days longer than the people who didn't use FMLA at all. Um, but again, this is only about 7% of the sample. The majority of the people who use FMLA um, and short-term disability will use these concurrently. Okay. Now, intermittent leave, when somebody is using, you know, taking time off intermittently for their own condition uh, before they went on a short-term disability, 
Um, this indicates a slightly longer duration, but it's really only about two days. And we also measured people who were taking intermittent leave after short-term disability just to see if there's something about short-term disability takers um, that would be, you know, something that we can't measure um, that would make them different from other kinds of short-term disability or, or leave takers, but we don't really see a, a difference in this respect. So there is something to be said for, um, you know, that this finding is due to the fact that people are taking their leave before they go on short-term disability. Now, because FMLA use predicts short-term disability durations, it's not surprising that it also predicts the likelihood that a short-term disability claim will become a long-term disability claim. I'm not going to show those results. They are in the, in the document itself, which is, or, or the main study, which is available from IBI's website. <clears throat> but again, you know, we're talking about getting out in front of things early by using the information that you have um, when an issue comes up. So, a short-term disability claim itself does provide some kinds of information that case managers can use to assess um, which employees might most benefit from, let's say, return to work or disease management programs uh, to avoid costly or disabilities down the road. So one of the things, of course, that you know about when somebody goes out on disability is the diagnosis. Um, so here we have the top five diagnoses for short-term disability with the greater likelihood that a person is going to have a later long-term disability claim. Um, so, for example, 7% of, of claimants for neoplasms, we would expect them to have a long-term disability claim later. About 6% if we're talking about nervous system and sense organs or circulatory system uh, uh, disorders. Mental disorders, musculoskeletal, and connective tissues kind of round out the top five. Um, we do list all the different conditions in the document itself, um, and you can read those there. Now, before I pass it over to Maria, um, kind of as a segue into that, um, one of the things we did when we uh, finished the results or when we got them into shape, we shared them with employers at different organizations, um, people who manage uh, wellness benefits, HR benefits, disability benefits, and so on. We shared the results with uh, third-party administrators, um, disability suppliers, consultants, and so on. And we wanted to get their expert advice on what employers could do um, what, you know, with, with these kinds of results, what could they do to get out in front of, uh, of situations before they become worse and, and you know, more costly to employers. And again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because Maria's gonna tell us, give us a, 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 a succinct case study of, of what happened at one organization. And you can read more deeply uh, in the research article or, or in the, uh, excuse me, in, in the IBI publication but real quickly, one of the things we heard very consistently was, was something that I've uh, kind of been reiterating here all along, is that employers um, should start to connect their employees with the, any, any of the resources that they make available at the first indication uh, that there's a serious medical condition. So for example, when I says, I'm, you know, I'm taking FMLA off, it's for a serious medical condition of a family member, this is the time to start <clears throat> uh, connecting them with uh, EAP programs, stress management programs. Um, if somebody is going out for, let's say, back pain, this is the time to get ergonomic interventions. Um, again, FMLA leave, even though it's not always at the discretion of the employer to, to uh, tell people they, they, their leave is not covered under FMLA, there's nothing in the law that prevents them from asking people to work through it if they can make some kind of accommodation. So again, getting in early and discussing people's uh, ability to stay on the job and work through it rather than take leave um, earlier, earlier better. It's always better. Um, coordinating benefits across silos. Um, we talked to a lot of people and they told us that they, if, if they manage the disability benefits, unless, um, unless somebody has taken their leaves concurrently, they would never know that a person had used FMLA at all or that they had asked for leave under FMLA. So they're not seeing these things early on and this is where we would want to start coordinating. And finally, um, we heard uh, quite a few times that it, it's not just HR and benefits who are involved, it's supervisors, it's the employees themselves, and the more that they know about FMLA, the more that they know about the employer's rights and their, and their own rights as employees and the rights of supervisors, um, the better they're going to be at anticipating the demand for leaves, and again, getting out in front of them, and, uh, and using that information early on to forestall costlier uh, leaves. 
Um, let, me, let me turn it over to Maria Henderson, who is going to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, FMLA and a little bit about how, uh, how it worked at PG&E. Thanks, Brian. Maria, you <clears throat> well, have the floor now? Okay. Do I have control? Let's see. Show I believe you do. Let's make sure. Does everybody see PG&E up here? Or Brian, since you're the only one not muted? Okay, we're good to go. So um, good morning, everybody, or for those joining maybe from the East Coast, it it may be afternoon by now. But um, Brian, as Brian mentioned, I am Maria Henderson, and I work at Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which is a Northern California utility company. And as you can see from the slide that we're, we're presenting here, um, we have all of the aspects. We're vertically integrated as a utility. So we generate uh, energy, we transmit and distribute it, and then we do the full um, customer service of that energy. So um, as you can see on the next slide, let me make sure I can get me going here. Let's see. Where is it? Let's see. Brian, I'm having trouble with my slide. Oh, there we go. Um, we have a very diverse uh, population of folks based on that profile. So um, really quickly, just to ground everybody, because I know it's always nice to know um, how similar an employer is that's, that's presenting. So um, given, given the, the diverse workforce, we have over 21,000 employees that um, work in this Northern California area. Um, what's unique to PG&E that might surprise some folks on the phone is that over 70% of those 21,000 employees are uh, in a union, represented by a union. Um, that's, uh, as, as many of you know, California has a higher union-represented population, but uh, when you're in a group that deals with the um, uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, um, majority of our jobs fall under that, and so we have very large union representation. But we also have a fairly large group, a couple thousand of engineering and scientists of California. Um, so again, this diverse population ranges from individuals that may be answering phones in a call center to line workers who it takes seven years for them to get to journeyman status, and they have highly physically demanding jobs, lifting over 100 pounds, climbing at unprotected heights and working around high risks of electric, electricity to um, nuclear physicists and engineers, a PhD level engineers, um, to, to general office staff, HR, corporate finance. So a very, a very large gamut. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our physical workers, um, they may range from entry level utility worker jobs, um, but we do have this group of linemen, about 1,800 individuals, who are very, very skilled physical workers. So although their job is very heavy, according to the classification, uh, it does take them many, many years, and they have to have uh, an in-depth knowledge of all kinds of electrical equipment and math and science to get there. So they're a very... Um, valued asset for us, if you will, and keeping them healthy and on the job is important. Um, because we are a utility and we are regulated here in the state of California, folks tend to stay here from hire to retire. And uh, we do have an average age of 47 and tenure of 15 years. Um, that is a little misleading, as many, many averages are. We've had a, a large amount of folks retiring over the last few years. And just to give you kind of a benchmark, last year we hired in 3,000 new people to kind of replace and, and take over for retirements and attrition that had happened over the last couple of years. So actually, if you were to look at our average age and tenure, it would look very much kind of bifurcated between a group that's fairly young or low tenured uh, with a group that has higher age and, and higher tenure. So the average is a little misleading. From the perspective of our health and productivity profile, just so the story that I tell next um, makes more sense to you, we're pretty much self-insured across the gamut of all of our benefits and health and productivity programs. We're completely self-insured on group health. We do have two administrators and uh, two provider networks uh, that we use in that self-insured um, self group. 
Um, our workers' comp is also self-insured and self-administered, which I know is somewhat unusual across the United States, but actually here in the state of California, all three of the large utilities are all self-administered, so um, somewhat common here. We do not have a voluntary short-term disability plan or a short-term disability insurance. We depend on the California state disability plan. Our employees pay small amounts out of their payroll, and we go through that, that plan, which, as many of you know, creates incredible challenges around early return to work and the ability to get information to, to case manage early on. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but we do have a centralized and outsourced FMLA leave of absence uh, program through a third-party administrator. Um, we are also self-insured on long-term disability, which is also uh, un unusual. We do have that outsourced to a third-party administrator, however. We have in-house um, and centralized return-to-work team and an absence and accommodations team, and um, we do all our interactive um, uh, discussions and uh, job function analysis and everything in a centralized fashion, uh, which has been uh, quite successful for us. And we recently, beginning of this year, 2013, we also centralized and outsourced all of our health advocacy and wellness. So um, that's kind of who we are in a nutshell. Just, just also to give you a little background before we jump into our absence uh, management story and journey, um, we very much have a workforce health model that we think is, is uh, uh, really predicated on the holistic approach to health. So within our staff, um, our group, the workforce health group, includes all of, all of the benefits, including pension, insurance, group health, life insurance, everything, um, all of the employee assistance, wellness, absence and accommodations, workers' comp, fitness for duty, um, the, the whole gamut of what you would normally def see defined uh, uh, you know, in the textbooks around health and productivity. Um, we have a model that I'm showing now where we really see this as a continuum where we may touch our PG&E team members at any point on this continuum, and any issues around this continuum may cause a reduction in productivity or an absence or, or a complete loss of that individual. So we focus very much on preventative strategies at the top of our wheel in terms of health promotion and wellness. We have a huge focus this year on access to quality health care. Um, we want to make sure our folks are financially healthy in terms of their retirement and their life insurance safety net. Uh, we have some real gaps. Uh, we had over um, everyone that was under 40 in our physical workforce uh, they were not signing up for our life insurance. And you know, over the years as we've had fatalities or serious injuries, we have found that that, that left a lot of families um, undercovered. So we've done a lot of work on the financial health perspective. And, you know, then we touch people as they um, go through the process of, of maybe having issues that EAP can help with, maybe early signs of fitness for duty or having some sort of condition, chronic condition management. Then, of course, once they do go out, we have to employ our absence management and return to work strategies. And then when they have some, some sort of more permanent uh, restrictive disability, then, then we're really into a full-blown disability management type program trying to make sure we can get them to work, um, back to work, and, and back to productivity. So that, that's our model. We do have a few guiding principles that our team tries to stick with, so just additional context here. Uh, we have an incredibly well-developed integrated data warehouse um, that uh, allows us to have a lot of informed decision-making, and um, we have all of our medical disability, absence, performance, safety, grievance, Fitness for Duty, all, we have 33 data sources in that, and it's a really an amazing tool, and I would highly recommend that if you're at the beginning of your journey, you start with integrated data at whatever level you can because it makes all the difference in the world. Um, we also have an organizational structure where we put all the key pieces under one department and one leader to really promote integration and to really get us to the point where we're dealing with our line of business uh, partnerships and increasing process efficiencies. So we want our programs to be sustainable. Our employees have told us over the years that they're sick of the flavor of the month programs. You know, find a few that work, stick with them, make them work. 
Um, we just recently went through a complete redesign of all of our health um, care uh, programs so that everything is incenting uh, health and accountability. Oops, Brian, it's telling me that I have been disconnected from the go-to webinar. So I'm wondering if you want to pull up. Oop, am I back up? Okay. All right, let me know, Brian, if you lose my you lose visual. Um, and then we're also trying to maintain. Are you up? I can see you. Okay, good, good. I just got a flash that we were disconnected, so yell at me if we drop. You got it. Um, okay. And, um, of course, being in the state of California, compliance is, is very important to us. So let, let's jump into the meat, and I really kind of want to tell you a story here uh, that really began a journey um, kind of um, of how we came about um, managing absence and the lessons that we've learned, and, and hopefully um, folks on the phone can take a few pearls from this um, as they, they seek to improve their own programs. But like many of you out there, you know, at some point in time, PG&E did not have a centralized leave of absence. And basically for us, prior to 2008, all of the leave of absence were administered in a decentralized fashion out in the field. And, you know, I've got the experts on the phone here, so everyone knows the issues that that creates. Uh, in terms of inconsistency and issues with compliance. But, but more importantly, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. So by not having everything together, you really don't know how big your problem is. You don't know if you're getting better, and you really don't know um, um, where there might be pockets of issues. So in June of 2008, and this was prior to m me coming on board at PG&E, we went through the process of outsourcing really the bulk of our um, leave administration, including all of the FMLA, to a third-party administrator. And, you know, that is a very difficult thing to go through when you're trying to get history together and set up, you know, systems and, and um, train supervisors to deal with this new process. And, you know, we had a lot of bumps in the road like, like many other, other people do but you know after we kind of got through the first six six to twelve months and um, really got through just the growing pains that, that you do when you when you go through that process, the one kind of um, silver lining piece was that we had gotten to the point where we had really robust data collection based on this centralization and this outsourcing, and it really allowed us to start identifying. Um, problematic populations and areas where we really might need to focus our limited resources on from an absence management standpoint. And just a couple points here because one of the things I really worry about is uh, folks looking at data, both even in an aggregated benchmarking study or even in their own population on an average basis because averages hide so many outliers. And so I think it's really important that your data collection um, allow for some sort of business hierarchy that allows you to, to split your data up into a meaningful way that, that aligns with your leadership or aligns with whatever regional geographic things that however you split data and manage uh, your business so that you can identify problematic populations. And what I will say from an FMLA standpoint is a lot of people focus on FMLA being an early warning of medical issues. And I think that is important, and, and the IBI research really talked about how, you know, these, these uh, intermittent days can really be early warning signs that someone's going to go into a short or long-term disability status, and it's time now to really deploy all these great benefits and resources that you have. And I, I agree with that, and I think we, um, we definitely see some of that in our population. But what I want to kind of introduce to you today from our perspective and story is that if you see outrageously high rates of absenteeism, that you may want to look at other drivers and root causes that may not be medically related at all. I think high rates of FMLA are really a barometer for environmental and climate issues, culture issues in your, your company. And so let me, let me tell you a little bit uh, of a story. So as we gathered our data, we identified, and this is not going to surprise anyone, that our highest rates of absenteeism were in our call centers. And we have several call centers scattered throughout California with several thousand employees. And if you looked at those call centers, the FMLA and other types of absences were 
about five times greater than the rest of the company. And when you looked at kind of some of the aggregate data that was coming in around what medical conditions people were were using to certify their FMLA, they were definitely those types of diagnoses that one could say are a little more subjective diagnosis, um, migraines and low back pain and things that um, really lend themselves to higher rates of discretionary absence if, in fact, you just really don't want to be at work or there may be other things going on. And so as we did our outsourcing, we did all the right things. You know, we, we set up um, that our TPA pushed people to EAP. We had on-site EAP counselors at the uh, actually at the call center. So we have very high utilization of EAP. In some of our sites, our EAP utilization is, is 10% for the on-site counseling, just really high. Um, we have a really robust kind of office and call center ergonomics. As soon as anyone has discomfort, there's um, grassroots teams that evaluate body mechanics and put tools in place. So we had all of that, and we were still seeing a really high rate of absenteeism. So Oh, probably around October of 2009, and I was working with pg at, at that time in a consulting role, we decided to engage um, a consultant that also worked for our TPA and asked them to do a really deep dive, a diagnostic into m- what might be some of the root causes. And after a lot of work, multiple focus groups, and actually the union brought in their own consultant because they wanted the consultant to talk to their employees separately, You know, we found a lot of different things were going on, uh, and in the IBI research speaks to many of these. Um, You know, we found that we had inconsistencies in our management um, population, a way they were managing the absenteeism, um, some variances in the way attendance policies were being done, um, et cetera. But then we also found um, a lot of issues around job stress and work-life balance and satisfaction with the job. So, you know, after that, we were able to convince the leadership in the call centers to uh, do a lot of the best practices that you saw in the IBI research. Uh, We did um, kind of supervisor training to really align and create consistency. Um, We did address the small amounts of misuse um, by putting some peer-to-peer physician reviews in. And, And to let you know, We did uh, find a handful of people that were falsifying FMLA documents that resulted in some terminations, and that was actually well-received even in the union world because they didn't want their peers to get away with stuff like that, so they they actually appreciated the fact that we were doing that. We did some innovative rewards and recognitions, which I know can be kind of difficult around the FMLA um, statutory requirements, but we we did a, a grassroots effort, Be Here for Your Peer, And basically, we're letting folks know that their high levels of absenteeism were creating problems with us approving normal vacation schedules for people and that they were disrupting each other's vacation, planned vacation. And that was an uh, an interesting peer communication strategy that that helped create some, some peer pressure. We refocused our EAP and worked with our TPA to really improve case management and try to lock that down. After doing all of those best practices year over year for for two years straight, we did see a nice trend in reduction in absence, um, 3%, 4%, 5%. Um, and, you know, and given the, the altitude of that absence, that was good. But we knew there was still a root cause and some issues there. And um, the union actually came back in, brought their consultant back in, and we had new leadership come in to the call center, and we did another deep dive. And what we basically found out was that the employees were telling us that, hey, you know what, you broke the psychological employment contract with us. You hired us years ago, and you told us that this was a part-time job. And so the people that gravitated to these jobs were single moms with multiple kids that were looking to get onto some sort of benefits, college kids that were needed a part-time flexible schedule in order to finish their degrees, or maybe even folks that had already retired from another job were coming back part-time to work because their spouse was in an independent role and they needed the benefits. So we actively went after this population of people. And then, as soon as we got them into the job, because of 
the way our staffing levels were and problems that we were having, we forced them into mandatory overtime, a lot of mandatory overtime. And so as normal human nature would be, those folks had, uh, we took away their ability to manage their obligations outside of work. So as most human beings will do, they used the system that was built in front of them to start figuring out how to get that flexibility back. And so we saw all types of unintended consequences around what I would call discretionary absence and even trying to cover uh, tardiness and, and circumvent tardiness policies. So after all of this work and all of this time, our new VP of the call center, we met with her and she basically said, you know what, I've seen this in multiple call center environments. Immediately I'm abolishing all mandatory overtime and we're going to put in some flexible work uh, shift changes and all kinds of little things that people can do to manage their flex time. And in that 12-month period from the um, abolishment of the mandatory overtime and the more flexible environment, we had absenteeism go down 12% that next year. So the moral of the story for us was um, sometimes the early warning signs of extremely high FMLA may not be medically related at all, and you may have to take a different approach and bring in your operational leadership, your unions, and other folks to really get some open and honest discussion about what's going on to really get to the root cause and make a difference. So, Brian, that's our story, and we'd love to get, take questions from folks. Very good. I'm going to open up for questions, and there's a very – very instructive practical application on, on using information about absence and, and different kinds of work conditions and you know to take not only the, the health temperature of the organization but the organizational temperature of the organization. Does that make sense? Um, it, it actually you know it, it, it almost works as a commercial for a piece <laughs> of IBI research that just came out uh, yesterday where we look at the work climate management with, with uh, relations with management. Um, safety culture and so on, and how this affects stress, how this affects health, and how this affects absence. Um, so please check that out on IBI's website as well. We have a few minutes. I've opened up the lines. Um, if anybody would like to ask any questions, uh, feel free to do so. And I think, Brian, we can take questions on the chat feature of the GoToMeeting as well. I believe so. I believe that is also open. No questions from the crowd. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you all for attending. Um, and again, you know, feel free to contact me with any questions you may have by email. Um, you can find my email. Uh, I am bgifford at ibiweb.org. Um, I can also pass anything to Maria and see if she can help answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Maria Henderson and PG&E, for participating in this talk. I really appreciate it. It was very informative. You're welcome, Brian, and uh, everybody have a safe and healthy Memorial Day.